19.1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Now, scourging was called by the Romans near death. The Roman citizens were not supposed to be scourged, but if you were a slave or an outsider, they could give you 39 lashes, and that's what they did. It was done by an instrument called a flagellum. The flagellum was a wooden-handled whip, and connected to that whip was nine strips of leather. They were six to seven feet long, and they would have on the ends of them bones from animals, rocks, things like that. So each time, and we'll look at that a little bit later, what, what happened when they were scourged. If you look at the next portion of Scripture, it's Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And we're going to look at verses 27 to 31. Matthew 27, 27 to 31. Uh, I got a new Bible because I can't see my old one, so I'm going to take a little while here. Matthew 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him, put on him a scarlet robe. When they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe from him, put it on his own raiment, and led him away to be crucified. The mocking, the beating, the reed that they used was probably a bamboo, and they would hit him with that. His body was swollen, his body was bruised, and you might know his body was bloody. Now, they put a scepter in his hand, and they mocked him, saying that he was the king of the Jews. He had a crown of thorns on his head, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And they would have used that reed to pound those thorns into his skull. Hail him, king of the Jews. All right? So far, this is what Jesus has gone through. We'll look at it a little closer a little bit later. All right, now I want you to look, if you would... John 19, please. <clears throat> John 19, verse 17. John 19, verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, uh, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on his cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The title then read, Many of the Jews... For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. It was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but write, He said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered and said, What I have written, I have written. Now, 
basically the reason it was in three different languages and they said it was near to the city these were the three languages that people knew in that day and they would write these signs and put them above the cross and as the people would walk by they'd read what the crime was that that person had when you saw somebody walking through the streets carrying a cross he wasn't going to a picnic he was going to his death and this was great entertainment to these people they would flock to the crucifixion site just to see who was there they'd mock him they'd spit on him and what the, the movie didn't portray it this way, but a lot of times people say that the cross was not that high up in the air. It was low enough that the people could walk past and see the sign and then actually spit on that person. So don't get confused saying that the cross was probably so high nobody could ever, could ever reach him. Okay? We've got scourging, we've got mocking, We've got procession through the streets. And when he's walking through the streets of Jerusalem, he's surrounded by soldiers. And he's, the soldiers are led by a centurion. You saw him on the horse in the front. Around his neck was a small sign. They would put this small sign around the neck of the prisoner. And, many, and they named the crime that he was guilty of. Now let's look at one more passage John 19, you're already there. Look, if you would, in verses 18 to 23. Oh, we read that already, didn't we? I'm sorry. We nail, he goes to the place of the skull, and he's nailed to the cross. And we'll look at that a little bit later, too. Now, the, the thing that you have to understand is, when Jesus was walking through the streets, he probably was just carrying the cross beam. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. He wasn't carrying the whole cross. It would have been too heavy. It's thought that he only walked probably about a third of a mile before he dropped. And then they would get him to the place of crucifixion. They would dig a hole, connect the cross beam and the cross upright, and they would drop the prisoner after being nailed to the cross, I'm gonna show you how they nailed him, into a hole. The cross would go into a hole, and as it went into the hole, the whole body would be shook. And the nails would tear, and his ribs, and everything like that. And this was the pain, and the exposure, and the anguish of the crucifixion. All right, now let's look at this. I'm gonna. I don't want to be gory or anything, but I want you to see, because we're going to have communion after this, right after this. And I want to go right into the communion so you know the body that was broken for you. Jesus had been up for about 36 hours. He had had two trials illegally. He had dinner with his disciples. And he walked about two and a half miles from the place of the Last Supper to Jerusalem. He carried the cross, like I said, in the city after he had been scourged and mocked for about a third of a mile. And you know they called somebody out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, to help him carry his cross. Now scourging was not for the average Roman citizen. It was only for traitors and for slaves. They'd strip you naked, tie you to a post or a wall. We saw that in the movie. Your back would be exposed all the way down to your heels. Every part of your back was exposed. 39 lashes was applied by two Roman soldiers. Now these guys were experts in torture and death. And they were probably big fellas too. They looked like pro football players. The wooden handle had nine leather strips, as I said. And on the ends of the strips, there was bone and there was rock. Um, as, the, as the soldier would whip the person, he would whip his wrist like this. When he did that, that would tear the skin even more. 
And on the back of Jesus, the skin was so torn that muscles would be showing through his entire back. The, the, the different uh, times he was whipped would cause scars or cuts about two inches long. It would take 20 stitches to, to seal one of these. Multiply that times 39. It comes out to about 2,000 stitches would have needed to be applied to keep Jesus from bleeding. But you know, he didn't bleed to death, and I want to make this very, very clear. He didn't bleed to death. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But the injuries that he had did not kill him. Keep that in mind. And the reason that the bleeding wasn't so profuse was it was cold. And the capillaries would seal as the weather was colder, so they didn't bleed as profusely as they could have. Um, the muscles, as I said, where the cuts were, would be popping out of his back. While on the cross, it said that birds would come and pick at his back, at the muscles that were there. How long did a person live on the cross? It just depends. Some people lived a few hours. Some people lived a few days. And they, there was no rhyme or reason to it. He was beaten on his face by the soldiers and by the people that were walking past. His eyes were probably swollen shut and his nose was probably bleeding. You know when you get a bloody nose what it's like. His lips were probably tattered. And you know what? He could have even had some teeth knocked out. His jawbone wasn't broken. Now, you say you get hit in the face with fists and a, a reed. Why didn't his jawbone or his nose break? Anybody know? That's right. Psalm 3420, not a bone of his would be broken. Amazing, isn't it? The crown of thorns, the crowns were one and a half to two inches long, and they were sharp as an ice pick. They were formed into a crown. They were placed on his head and then pounded there by the reed. They were tapped down. Now, if you ever had a cut on your scalp or your forehead, it bleeds profusely. His back was torn to shreds, and while he's hanging on the cross, you got to understand, this crossbar was not finished plywood. It was rough. It was like a railroad tie. That's what it was. So every time that Jesus moved, the splinters, whatever was in this wood, would cut his back and make it worse. Now, as he hung on the cross, he never went in shock. He never went unconscious or didn't have a nervous breakdown, as some people say. He was healthy. He was a healthy man in his early 30s, hardy and strong. Do some of you remember how you were in your early 30s? <laughs> John, that's you, isn't it? No. But you know what? In your early 30s, you were strong as an ox. You could do whatever you wanted, and you had no qualms about it. The cross was in two parts. The cross bar weighed about 125 to 150 pounds, just the cross bar. It was like a railroad tie, as I said. Had a rough, rough surface. It was unfinished. That was called a plantibulum. That was what the crossbar was called. On his back, while he walked through the city, this is what he carried. Now, if you're carrying the crossbar, a lot of times the hands would be tied on either end of the crossbar. When he fell, what did he land on? The crossbar. Again, torture, pain. 
And as I said, this was entertainment for these people. They didn't have Xbox and Netflix and everything like that. They loved crucifixions because it gave them some place to go, something to do, and be entertained. The nails that he had through his hands and his feet were not through his palms. You cannot put a nail and nail somebody across through the palms. It's too soft and it's too easy to tear out. Did anybody ever have carpal tunnel syndrome? That's where they put it, right at that muscle. They, see, it says the nails in his hands and his feet, and you might say, well, that's your wrist. A hand technically goes up to your wristwatch, okay? So basically, they would put it through your wrist right here, where your carpal tunnel uh, tendon is, and that would hold you on the cross. Otherwise, it wouldn't have. Um, his feet were done the same. And the first and second metatarsal bones is where they put the nails through his feet. Same deal. Now, um, the way that they breathed while they were on the cross was that the diaphragm would drop down, okay? Now, I want you to do something for me. Take a breath. Take a breath, all right? That's the only way Jesus could breathe, but his diaphragm had dropped down, so he had to push himself up in order to breathe. Now, here's another thing I want you to do. I want you to try and talk while you're taking a breath. Can you? No. Why are the words so precious that Jesus said while he was on the cross? Because in order for him to speak, he had to do it when he exhaled rather than inhaled. It was easy for him to inhale. He just lifted himself up. But to be able to speak, he had to do it while he's exhaling. Um, and every time he pulled himself up, he dealt with the splinters. When you speak again, it's hard to speak when you're exhaling. All right? Now, this description might have affected you. It might bother you. I hope it does because we're going to realize that this was the very, very torturesome, painful, and it was terrible. It was the worst kind of death that any man could ever think of. Did Jesus deserve this? He was on the cross, and he had done nothing to be there, nothing. He was convicted and tortured and condemned for something he was not guilty of. He did this for you and for me. Now, amen. Thank you, John. Yes. Yeah, Pilate said there's no guilt in him. I'm going to let him go, but the crowd wouldn't let him do it. Well, he didn't, he didn't really want to do all this to Jesus. His wife had had a dream the night before and told him they shouldn't do this. People would come by and mock and spit and laugh. It wasn't intended to kill a person, okay? Crucifixion was not originally intended to kill a person. It was for them to suffer and then finally die, be humiliated. Now, when they came out, you remember that the soldiers came out and the two thieves were still alive. What did they have to do to them? Break their legs. Do you know what part of the leg they broke? The shin. Ever been kicked in the shins? That's probably one of the hardest bones to break. They'd come out with a mallet and it would break the shin bones. 
And then after the shin bones were broken, the man would live probably four to six minutes. Why? Couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe. He's asphyxiated. Now, when they came out to break Jesus' legs, did they have to break them? No. Why? He was already dead. He was already dead. He had been on the cross for six hours. The other two were still alive, but he was gone. Why did they take a spear and pierce his side if he was already dead? Ever think about that? What? Yep. And Zechariah said, we looked upon those who, him who we pierced. It was prophecy from Zechariah. They didn't need to do it. He was already dead. He had already been dead. And he didn't die of a heart attack. He didn't die of blood loss. And this is what people say. That's what killed him. But you know what? The Bible says that no man took his life. He gave it up. Gave it up. Have you ever heard of anybody that could do that? No. No man took it. He has the power to give it up, and he got that authority from his father. He gave up his own life. Now, could he, as God, have chosen not to die? Could he have? But he didn't. He didn't. That's what John is teaching on Wednesday nights. This is the price he paid for you and for me. And unless we do something like this, maybe we don't realize how he suffered. No one ever suffered like this for me, for no reason. I'm not worth it. Who am I that a man should bleed and die for? Nobody. Nobody. We're going to have communion now. And as we do, I want us to realize and keep in your mind what we just talked about. And as we take of the broken body and of the blood, think about it. Think about it. Really think about it. Concentrate on it. Because this is what's coming up in the next few weeks. Fellas?